Okay. So welcome everybody to What Are Golden Eagle Nestlings Eating? My name is Sammy Riccio and I am the Donor Engagement Coordinator for Hawk Watch International. The presentation today should run for around 50 minutes and then we will save the last 10 minutes for questions and answers. So if you have any questions throughout the chat, throughout the event, please put them in the chat. We are able to offer the programming for free thanks to ZAP for those of you who are local to Salt Lake County and with additional support from donors like you. So today we're gonna to hear from Dustin Maloney who is Hawkwatch International's very own research associate and is also a PhD student at Utah State University. So Dustin, how are we doing on your end with the tech? <laughs> All right, perfect. All right, everybody, super sorry about that uh, delay there, um, you know, bouncing between all these different platforms for, um, you know, presentations this is a little confusing sometimes, and I apologize for that, but uh, let's get started. Uh, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, what golden eagle nestlings are eating in Western Utah. Uh, we specifically focused on nestlings for this project. Um, I think it has uh, a scope of inference that could also probably cover adults because they eat a lot of the prey as well. So... Just gonna close that a little bit. Um, I've included a lot of photos from our nest sites. Uh, you feel free to throw stuff in the chat if you guys have any questions about any of the pictures you guys see or the species you guys see. Um, and I'm happy to answer all that stuff at the end. Um, and I just want to, uh, you know, thank my uh, contributors and the collaborators, especially from the beginning, the folks on this uh, presentation, Dr. C. Slater, uh, Robert Knight. Uh, Clark Rushing and Kezia Menlove, uh, they've all been very instrumental in this project, so I want to thank them all right away. So, uh, we did this with a lot of motion activated cameras at nests, and that's how we collected this data. So, let's get started. All right, you may see that I'm a little frazzled and slightly tired today. Uh, that is because for the past few days, I've been doing about 12 to 14 hour days uh, accessing nests and sampling birds. So, what does that entail? Basically, what you see right there, a lot of hiking up to the tops of cliffs, uh, rappelling down into nests, becoming disgusted into the nest uh, with the nest when I smell the remains of prey and things like that. Uh, but it is a lot of work, heavy packs, things like that, long days. Uh, especially if you live in Utah, you know that's been very, very windy lately. So that has also taken a toll. But uh, bear with me, if you will, please. Um, and yeah, here we go. So, um, this project is, uh, it's kind of larger than just the diet, but uh, we'll focus on the diet today. Um, but I am going to give you some background on golden eagles in Utah and around the West, uh, the motivations for the project, and then the methods, uh, some of our preliminary results from the first two years of the study, uh, some interesting ecological disturbances that have occurred over the past couple of years that have impacted our study, but also have probably uh, provided some interesting opportunities. And then kind of the additional benefits to motion activated cameras that I see. Um, and this stuff is, uh, you know, very novel, but I think that here in Utah, we've kind of captured some very interesting aspects of golden eagle ecology. So um, let's get started with that. So just some background on golden eagles. They are generalist apex predators. You can see on the left there is uh, an old Dustin Maloney from I think 2015, 2016 holding a nestling golden eagle. That nestling is about seven, seven and a half weeks old. Uh, and on the right there is two nestlings with an adult. And so these birds are long lived, uh, that, you know, between 15 and 25 years in the wild. And the nestlings take about uh, 10 weeks to leave the, leave the nest, um, this for that fledge age. Uh, they don't reach sexual maturity until about five years old. So it's kind of a, a very large gap between first year and then um, when they can actually reproduce. Uh, they are the top of the food chain. I've seen them, you know, on photos chase away coyotes, things like that. Um, they're not too afraid of things. They'll take on a lot of, a lot of different species of animals. So uh, they're, you know, very similar to dinosaurs in the way that uh, they develop and that they grow, you know, pretty much 80% of their entire body, you know, size, uh, bone structure, stuff like that uh as a nestling and kind of in that first year and then they just kind of bulk out more or less and kind of develop a little bit more um as they age um but yeah that 80 percent kind of right away so you can see on the left it's very very large large nestlings in my hand there um and we're actually fitting it with a backpack transmitter that i'll talk about later as well 
Uh, yeah, and like I said, they have the apex predators at the top of their food chain. Uh, they have a primary prey resource of lagomorph, so black-tailed jackrabbits, uh, desert cottontails here in the West. Uh, and but they do prey upon a lot of things. Up in the left-hand corner of the photo, you can see there's a uh, I think it's got a white tail. Oh no, it's a uh, mule deer fawn, and then uh, some other prey remains in the nest as well. Uh, raven feathers, things like that. And you'll see many, many different types of species that they actually feed on as we go. Um, so top of the food chain, long-lived. Uh, they'll have one to two offspring per year uh, if they can. A lot of times, though, if the resources aren't there for them to reproduce, you know, say the, the prey population is low, uh, there's a lot of disturbance in the area, they may not breed at all, and they may hold off till next year. That's kind of that long life strategy of holding off to kind of maximize your reproductive output when it's the most beneficial for yourself. So if they have the ability, they'll reproduce, but if they don't, uh, they'll just hedge your bets and wait till next year. That long life strategy. So uh, some background. So the motivations on Golden Eagle Nestling's health, uh, kind of what we're doing right now. You know, we at Hawkwatch had done a lot, and especially Steve Slater, had done a lot of uh, background research uh, on the populations here in Utah in collaboration with uh, the DOD, Dugway Proving Ground, and uh, have, we've developed a very, very large uh, data set on the population here in Utah uh, all across the West Desert, um, extending from basically the Idaho border down to the Arizona border, more or less, and a lot of that has come also from collaborations with the BLM uh, and Forest Service. And so, um, with all of that kind of historic data, we really were kind of primed and ready to take on a more uh, uh, narrow focus or kind of a more in-depth focus on this nestling health aspect. So uh, some papers came out recently earlier this year. Ecotoxicology, I believe that one was in the science, uh, one of those science publications, uh, talked about demographic, demographic implications of lead poisoning. Uh, essentially talking about how lead is actually much more prevalent than we think, and that may actually be influencing adult survival, adult uh, reaction times, things like that, uh, but also have a cascading effect down the chain into younger ages as well as they feed on carcasses that have been shot uh, with lead shot from guns and things like that during hunting season, and uh, as well as uh, electrocutions and poisoning are also issues. Um, essentially, the the paper was stating, and the second paper as well um, by uh, Brian Millsap, I believe, uh, was saying that the leading cause of death with golden eagles at the current uh, current moment is anthropogenically related. So you know, uh, more development, habitat change, poisons, poisoning, electrocution, things like that, uh, and. That stuff's only going to get uh, larger as time goes on, right? So that you know, humans are going to continue to expand over the environment, and that is going to grow kind of the anthropogenic reach, impacting these birds more. So we're only expecting this number to go up, probably, um, the cause of death stuff. And so that's a big concern of ours. Uh, disease outbreaks has been a much large, uh, now I'd say it's a, it's a very large concern as well. Uh, especially in the past couple of years, RHD2, that rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus 2, uh, hit in 2020 in Utah. It has spread very quickly across the Intermountain West and to the West Coast, uh, taking out a lot of that primary prey resource, those lagomorphs, so that, you know, those jackrabbits, those cottontails. And then if you've heard recently, the highly pathogenic avian influenza flu has uh, hit Utah as well, I think uh, a month ago or this month. and is yes spreading throughout the west so these two disease outbreaks will definitely have impacts on these birds especially developing nestlings that may not have the energy allocation or developed immune systems that maybe the adults have um, so that's something that we need to be concerned about and then the uh the parasite range expansion so you know there's been this uh issue of the poultry bug uh in you know, southern idaho and down in arizona and things like that and we had not seen it in Utah until actually just recently, and I was able to document it on camera. And so we're starting to get worried about how that is being, you know, distributed across the landscape, spreading, and hopefully with these cameras, as I'll talk about, um, we can capture some of that stuff as well. So parasites, disease, uh, anthropogenic causes of death, all these things are very, very uh, of large concern for us. And then we also have to reconsider the state of the population of golden eels in Utah. 
uh, I believe in that Millsap paper, they talked about um, about 30,000 eagles in the U.S., maybe it was the lower 48, and that that number is kind of kind of firm, but kind of in question as well. The, you know, so they suggested that the, uh, the breeding age is at five years old. So it's very, very hard to track these birds across time as they kind of develop. And so, you know, we can document that first year bird. And then, you know, if we capture adults, we can kind of take some data on them. Uh, but if we don't put out satellite transmitters, it's very, very difficult to figure out where they're going, what they're doing, because a lot of those middle ages, you know, two through four, they're kind of just bouncing around, looking for territories, uh, migrating around places, eating things, uh, just kind of living, surviving. And then as soon as they reach five, they kind of start reproducing. So the little, a lot of unknowns kind of in that middle age class. And so, you know, the survival of each age class going on can uh, come into question. So we're trying to figure out and get a real firm estimate of the population. So both this population estimate question and these threats has really driven us to kind of dig down into this nestling health issue. And one of those ways we could do that is looking at the diet of the birds here in Utah. So why is our study system really good? Uh, you know, I had mentioned a minute ago about Hawkwatch's historic data, really great collaborations with DOD and Dugway Proving Ground, BLM, folks like that. And so we have, you know, 10 plus years of historic data across the range. And we know kind of the normal activity, as well as we uh, collaborate with other partners to do rabbit surveys, again, that primary prey resource. And so our study system is kind of primed for that with all the different landscapes and features that we have here in Utah. Uh, but one thing that I really like about our study system is these are precocial nestlings. So they are stuck in the nest, which precocial basically just means that they develop in the nest and they can't leave it. Uh, and they rely on the adults. So they are easy to capture you know, rain or shine, you know, on the left or the right, uh, they are going to be in that nest whenever I show up, if they're there. You know, if they're alive, they're there, they're gonna be there. So it's gonna be pretty easy to get them most times. Um, but that precocial uh, phase is really great at capturing and sampling. Uh, yeah, so also they also rely on the adults for provisioning of prey. That means that, you know, these, you know, in the estimate of this paper, I'll talk about in a second, uh, they suggested that about 6.5 kilometers was the territory range of these adults on their nesting grounds. And so we can, you can draw inference from the prey they bring that those prey occurred more or less within that 6.5 kilometer buffer around the nest. Uh, and that can provide us good information about, you know, what prey we would expect to see in that area, how many potentially are prey we're seeing in that area, what sort of contaminants those prey may have if they're being transferred to the chicks, um, lots of things like that. So there's a lot of ad, uh, advantages to seeing what is going on with these adults bring what back to the nest in terms of prey. And also a lot of these adults will bring back half of something. So you can see on the left there that half of a great blue heron. And it's generally because that adult has eaten the other half of it. And so we know what the adults are eating pretty much as well. Maybe we don't capture all of them, but we do know kind of what they're eating. And then uh, it is easier to sample nestlings than adults. Uh, you'll have to take my word for that, I would imagine, but uh, it, it looks a little rough on the left there. And that one wasn't, wasn't an ideal capture site. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, it's pretty easy to kind of get into these nests, capture the nestlings, get them out, sample them pretty quickly and put them back. Whereas the adults, we kind of have to draw them in using a baited site, a uh, whole net system, and it takes quite a few uh, staff hours to do that. So nests, you know, precocial nestlings that are stuck there in the nest and just waiting for you to go pick them off, like that's a, it's a pretty prime deal. You know, the nest access stuff is a little bit difficult, but yeah, them waiting in the nest is about as good as it gets. So great study system, diverse landscape here in Utah, um, a lot of different areas and uh, good, good birds for this. So just going back over it all again, just kind of the, the motivations. They do have those, uh, you know, different life features, increasing threats, a lot of different stuff here in the Great Basin, really perfect for us. And then, yeah, the populations in question sort of, and so we were trying to look into that. So what has been known before? Uh, up in the right-hand corner is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Ken Keller. He has done more for uh for golden eagle diet analysis kind of here in utah than probably anyone i know 
he has collected prey remains from golden eagle nests for over yeah over 40 some years i think and he is a machine he just goes out repels into these nests he has permits and so he's uh totally in the clear and when he goes in he'll ban the birds and then collect prey remains uh and this type of sampling is called passive sampling you uh find a prey remain uh document what it is uh usually toss it on the nest if it's all picked clean and just document what they've been eating based on what you observe at that moment Obviously, there's, uh, you know, some drawbacks to it, like every type of method. Uh, you only kind of capture that one glimpse in time. A lot of times these birds actually do remove items from their nests. Things may get knocked out, all sorts of things. Other scavengers like wood rats may come in and take things away. So you may see more large items than smaller items. Uh, that's one kind of drawback. But for the most part, you know, Kent's done an amazing job. Uh, but I think that, you know, potentially with our active sampling approach, with motion activated cameras at the nest, we'll be able to kind of dig a little bit deeper into this diet uh, question and maybe uh, help support or supplement some of uh, Kent's data. And I kind of feel like I'm standing on Kent's shoulders for this stuff. He's done an amazing job up till now. Like, I mean, he's still doing an amazing job, but he's done an amazing job giving us kind of a first approximation of the diet. I'm going over with these active, you know, this motion activated camera and assessing the diet that way, which kind of the, is the next step. And I'm pretty sure, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, 20 years, someone's gonna come along with even cheaper technology for video cameras and be able to put those in the nest and capture even more data. And they'll, you know, be standing on Ken's and my shoulders uh, to do that. You know, it's kind of how science goes. So, you know, a lot of respect for Kent uh, and everything he's done. And as you can see, he had collected over 26,000 prey remains uh, from this uh, passive sampling, you know, effort across Utah for the past 40 some years. Uh, and actually in his top four prey items in this paper they published and also in his data set was uh, jackrabbits first, cottontails second. So again, that primary prey resource of lagomorphs uh, and then rock squirrels and then yellow bellied marmots. And we'll talk about those last two. It's kind of interesting um, that those were the ones that they found. Uh, but also keep in mind, you know, the size of these items potentially, and how it may differ from what my analysis is kind of looking at this point in time you know, the preliminary stuff. In that paper that I have uh, cited there, uh, that 2021 paper by Jesse Brown, uh, Jeffrey Bajorjian, and Pink Keller himself, uh, was really amazing. It, it, you know, it broke down in a lot of different statistical ways. Can we explain habitat, diet, things like that? Is there correlations, connections between all these things? Uh, and they did some really interesting work. And yeah, I think at the end, it was kind of a, uh, you know, we can definitely learn more about this stuff. And uh, with more data, we'll be able to do that. And hopefully this active sampling assessment that I'm doing will provide more of that information. And we can see how it compares as well. So uh, the study range for the project we've been doing lately, the past couple of years, you can see on the left there is all the sample locations that I've done. Uh, color coded the purple ones are the ones they've sampled both in 2020 and 2021. Uh, so just some of the methodology that we've been doing uh, is on the right there that you know we act you access these nests in the cliff faces. They're generally cliff nesting birds. Access it by rappel, we'll go up to the top of these cliffs, hike up there. When the birds are around three or four weeks old, once they can thermoregulate, uh, we'll build an anchor usually using uh, either uh, some rebar or some natural features like rocks and, uh, you know, crevices to put in some sort of camming device or something we can kind of lock into there um, and then build a, an anchor with some ropes or some um, tubular webbing and carabiners. And then we go right off the top of that cliff, like you saw in the beginning, uh, and go down into these nests and ca hand capture these birds. We don't usually wear any gloves um, besides, you know, PPE during times like now. And uh, just kind of yeah, get the nestling into a bag, maybe do some some wrangling at that seven week old age when they're a little bit more feisty and uh, bring them up to the top. And when we're down there, you know, after we brought them up to the top, we'll do this kind of uh, uh, some biological sampling and some morphometric uh, measurement stuff. So we'll take a lot of data on uh, the how, you know, wide their tarsus or they're kind of like their the lower end of their leg is. Uh, we'll take data on how, you know, the size of their head from the top of their uh, beak to the back of their head. 
as well as how long their hallux is. And the hallux is that kind of that back, back towel, and that's pretty, uh, pretty large and scary if you've ever seen one in person. Definitely don't, don't want to get caught by one of those. Um, but yeah, so we'll get onto the top and take some blood, uh, doing that for contaminants, uh, parasites, and disease antibodies. We're uh, assessing all that through labs. We'll also collect feathers, look at different health metrics, uh, and also pieces of DNA, um, number of things we can do with that. And then we've also been collecting uh, oral and cloacal swabs. Some of this stuff was kind of ad hoc in the beginning, and since then I've actually found some pretty good um, uses for some of the, the swabs, I should say, especially. Um, everything else we've kind of got uh, planned out, but I just actually got a proposal um, grant for the swab stuff, so things are looking up for those. Uh, we also plant uh, data loggers actually in the nest themselves, so we actually kind of sift out uh, about four to five inches down into the nesting material uh, and then place a five inch screw down into the nest. You know, it's pretty dense once you get past the top layer. Uh, put about a five inch screw down in there, push it down, and then we have, I have uh, devised a very highly technical system of a team fuser uh, with duct tape around it. And it has a data logger in there that's about the size of a nickel and it records temp uh, temperature and relative humidity on uh, every uh, 30 minutes, I believe. And so this kind of provides us some microsite characteristics of, you know, how, you know, wet or humid is the nest itself um, and how hot is this nest getting? That provides us some information on, you know, potential parasite loads. How are these parasites in areas where there's uh, wetter nest systems? Uh, are they in hotter nests? Things like that. So these uh, iBind data loggers are actually pretty useful for those microsite characteristics um, and looking at correlations with other uh, stressors and everything like that. Uh, we've also been putting out uh, solar Argos uh, GPS telemetry backpacks. Uh, we'll uh, see some photos of that and I'll put, point them out, but they've been um, very, very useful. And some of those have been donated by Use Fish and Wildlife Service as well as DOD, you know, Dugway Proving Ground, some other folks, BLM. And those have provided some very useful information as well, as far as uh, kind of an unbiased survival rate and some other stuff I'll talk about later. But so a lot of things we're doing with these birds once we kind of get them. And we don't just do it all at once. You know, we take some of the biological sampling around uh, the first sampling event. And then the second sampling event, we might slap on one of those uh, backpack solar, you know, telemetry units um, to get actual, you know, post, post fledged location data. So it's all very interesting stuff. Um, pretty straightforward, though. And the cameras that we, you know, once we've sampled the birds, uh, we'll kind of go down, place a camera about two meters from the nest. Uh, it's on a, a setting of about two photos every minute, or two photos when it's activated, and then about 30 minute quiet period, uh, or two minute quiet period, and then the motion activated once again, starts running again. And then we have a time lapse of every 30 minutes, so it takes one photo every 30 minutes. Um, and that's been a very, very, very useful um, uh, method for collecting this diet data. Um, and you might think to yourself, oh, is uh, putting a camera near an eagle's nest uh, potentially disturbing, you know, and, you know, we've done our kind of research and that, uh, that three and a half, four week range is kind of right in that window when these birds have really committed to these nestlings. Like I said before, they're long lived. And so they, you know, they have this uh, strategy of, uh, do I want to reproduce and put energy and resources into reproduction this year? Or do I need to keep these reserves for myself so I can live another year, maybe reproduce next year when it's more ideal for me to survive, plus also produce offspring? So you might think this might cause disturbance, but again, like I said, around that three or four, three, three or four week range, we see a pretty high commitment level for these nestlings. And we're in and out within, you know, easily about you know 40 minutes at the second round of sampling of that seven week age. Um, and then, you know, about an hour or so at that first round sampling. And so, uh, and if you uh, are extremely concerned, don't worry. We've had actually zero uh, nest abandonment, uh, over 40 to some nests that, uh, yeah, that I've sampled so far uh, over the course of the past two years. So uh, really haven't seen too much disturbance from these cameras, so it's not too bad. Um, captures a lot of data. So that's kind of the methods uh, in a nutshell. Uh, feel free to email me or contact me if you guys have any more questions with that stuff, but we'll move on. All right. Here's some preliminary data for you guys. Um, yeah, so 2020, 
uh, you can see that this is uh, based on preliminary data, those kind of uh, uh, rose colored circles with stars on the left there on that map are the locations that I analyzed for this kind of preliminary data set. Uh, we're going through them. We have lots and lots and lots of photos. So let me go back while I make sure you have. So yeah, on the bottom there, I kind of skipped over it. And in 2020, we deployed 22 cameras and collected about 300,000 photos. And in 2021, we deployed about 20 cameras and got 310,000 photos. I've gone through about half of those so far. It is a slow, painstaking process, but it's incredible to learn more about the nesting ecology. I've been watching and studying these birds for about eight years now of Hawkwatch International. And I think going through the nest photos has been uh, probably one of the more informative uh, kind of uh, studies that I've been a part of so far. It's just so much data inside these photos, as you know, in terms of diet, and a number of things as well. I'll talk about. Uh, so yeah, go back to this one. Uh, preliminary data from the thirteen data uh, nests in twenty twenty. You can see we have a probably a pretty good even distribution across the West Desert there uh, in that I fifteen corridor. So you can kind of follow my mouse down. Here's I fifteen coming down this way. Uh, that's kind of the edge of our study boundary uh, from Idaho all the way down to Arizona down here. And yeah, we get a pretty good distribution across that range. Uh, a lot of this is just desert uh, basin range, Great Basin. And so we get a lot of that stuff in there. And what did we see from the preliminary data? Up here is the habitat composition. And so we see a lot of uh, shrub cover actually. And so down here, you can see the uh, types of cover. And you can see that large shrub cover amounts. Uh, a lot of that, all those are kind of in these desert systems. So a lot of shrub cover in the Great Basin, as you would expect. And then if you look down at the uh, types of class of species they're actually eating, you can see that they have high mammal. And a lot of the mammal stuff is basically uh, the, the lagomorphs early on and some ground squirrels and things like that, but predominantly the black-tailed jackrabbits and things like that. And you can see on the left, I kind of broke down some of those numbers for you guys. Uh, but yeah, just uh, what I want you guys to really know is that as we have high shrub cover, we generally see pretty high amounts of uh, mammal, mammalian prey in their diet um, and some of the uh, reptilian prey as well. And kind of a good mix of avian prey as well, but not too much in those desert systems kind of more down towards this uh, this kind of urban-ish corridor where these uh, avian prey are coming into play. And we'll keep that in mind for a second. Uh, so yeah, here's some numbers down here for you guys. Uh, top five we kind of saw in 2020 was, yep, black-tailed jackrabbit, that lagomorph. Uh, gopher snake, uh, number two, which was surprising. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, ground squirrels, you know, getting one of those uh, mammalian prey. Crown tails, and then unknown species. I haven't identified all of the items yet from each year, um, but it's at a pretty small number comparatively to the overall data set. So you can see shrub cover, mammalian prey, definitely some reptilian prey, and some uh, lower levels of avian prey in the shrub cover desert territories. So let's see how that compares with the 2020 samples. All right, so we have the Turquoise circles are the ones that we sample or I used for this kind of preliminary data set. And you can see at the, uh, the map on the left that a lot of our desert territories blinked off. And one of the things I kind of didn't mention a minute ago on the slides is that uh, Hawkwatch International does really intensive surveys in collaboration with uh, DOD and WA Proving Ground uh, throughout the military operating area, which basically extends to kind of just down below here and then all the way up to the border essentially of Idaho and then back down. It's a pretty large area and we have supplemented that with some surveys down here. And actually Ken Keller has been an amazing resources for, uh, resource for us and has also provided us information on nesting in this area uh, when these things are active uh, and has given me a heads up and allowed me to go out and sample those and place cameras at those sites as well. So a huge thanks to Kent as well and DOD and DPG um, for their support for the system. And what do we find? So this is kind of a smaller uh, subsample of the overall data set 2021. Uh, but we do see kind of a, a shift away from this kind of a dominated shrub habitat. Uh, you see that most of our uh, nests are kind of pushing more to this, you know, urban corridor along I-15 or pretty near the edge of that anthropogenic development. 
And so if we think what, you know, if they're moving towards anthropogenically disturbed or uh, developed areas, what does that potentially mean for the prey? Um, and then down here we see, you know, we still have halfway decent sizes of mammalian prey at a couple of our sites. Uh, the ones kind of in the, the desert still. But, you know, once you drop off from those uh, desert sites, you see a large increase in you know, some reptilian prey, but uh, overall avian prey was the one that was very striking for me. Uh, and again, I'll talk about why those avian prey are kind of very interesting. So uh, again, the top five species we saw in 2021, desert conchels, gopher snakes, brown squirrels, black-tailed jackrabbits, and then uh, I put unknown birds there, but it basically was overall birds. And you might be asking yourself, why did uh, jackrabbits go from number one to number four on the list all of a sudden? Well, it's one of those uh, ecological disturbances that I mentioned early on. Uh, the rabbit hemorrhage disease virus two hit the population or was detected for the first time in Utah in uh, July of 2020. And it has a high mortality rate. I mean, people are still kind of doing um, research on the mortality rate and kind of what's going on with the, the rabbits. But from previous studies, it's somewhere between 70 and 80% potentially mortality rate on the rabbits. And so, you know, high shrub cover equaled high mammalian prey. And when there's, you know, that primary pre, primary prey resource of a mammal of like a rabbit gets hit with a really bad virus, it takes a lot of them out. And we see a lot of those territories kind of blink off all of a sudden. And that's really because these birds see there's not those resources that are available for them. And they hedge their bets and say, you know what, I'm going to not allocate energy into reproduction and actually save it for the next year and try to reproduce then um, to then spread my genes. But for now, I'll, I'll hold off and just kind of feed myself. So, uh, yeah, kind of a different diet and a very interesting shift between the years. And I think in most of this, I would attribute to uh, the shift from desert territories into the anthropogenic corridor and due to our RHG2 virus. Uh, and this brings up some interesting questions. Uh, you see this very kind of bump up in avian prey. Another ecological disturbance I had mentioned early on was the highly pathogenic avian influenza uh, virus that has just kind of been reintroduced, essentially. Uh, the past month or so has been detected kind of across the United States. Uh, just detected in Utah, I think, this past month or so. Uh, and that's very, very dangerous. It's really uh, has a very, very high, uh, you know, has a very strong impact on these individuals, especially nestlings that have a, a developing immune system and maybe don't have the energy resources yet to allocate to fighting uh, a, a you know, novel virus or, you know, to, you know, fight a virus plus develop uh, physiologically. Um, and so, We'll see if the HPAI also has an impact on these birds' nesting success and productivity and how well the nestlings do with HPAI this year. Uh, 2022 is the final year of my, uh, my PhD research in collaboration with Hawkwatch, USU, and Away Proving Ground. And so uh, it's kind of a, it was an interesting twist to see uh, going from 2020, uh, where it was pretty standard. This is kind of what I would imagine to see across the desert for the past, you know, six, seven years. And then all of a sudden after 2020, you hit the, uh, oops, the, uh, have the rabbit hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic virus disease two hit and change everything up. And then now we have HPAI, that pathogenic uh, avian influenza. And how is that going to change things? Especially when they're eating more birds, uh, you know, which are tend to be the waterfowl at least tend to be uh, hosts or reservoirs for these species. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how that goes. Uh, you know, I think one of the other things that's interesting about this data is that, uh, you know, those top four for Kent's data was, uh, was jackrabbits, contails, ground squirrels, and uh, yellow-bellied marmots. Uh, and we didn't see a ton of marmots in our, our samples. A lot of the stuff was kind of in the desert, you know, we did have some mountain territories that we looked at, and they definitely had uh, those marmots in their diet. But, you know, for the most part, it was primarily those uh, desert territories feeding on those lagomorphs. And then as they shifted into that urban corridor, uh, they encountered more diverse habitats and thus more diverse, you know, prey assemblages, essentially. 
so we see that shift in habitat type and prey diversity and prey you know selection and so it's all kind of an, an interesting question of how how things are going to develop next year as well and again this is just kind of a, a subset of all of my data it's, it's taken me quite some time to get through these photos and so yeah we'll see what the final uh, data assessment kind of uh, predicts or shows for all this stuff um, just some other benefits real quick of these uh, you know motion activated camera traps for using them for this diet analysis you know we'll see a lot of different things and you know up in that left hand corner of that box is just kind of those trends um, over the past two years for their diet consumption you know it's funny actually i have zero percent fish on both of those and you wouldn't expect to see fish in a golden eagle's nest but i definitely had two two fish in 2021 i believe one was a carp and one was some sort of trout uh, I, I think they were probably scavenged from the shoreline somewhere uh and for those of you that think you know i had hoped to kind of add this but i've been on the field quite a bit lately so i wasn't able to kind of get to it uh quickly but you know i think there's a lot of times this belief that uh some of these you know desert territories might be feeding on uh livestock you know and if you look at kent's data uh there's definitely livestock that he detected and it's less than one percent i don't think i've detected a single sheep or lamb or cow or anything like that livestock wise definitely seen some big game in terms of deer again less than one percent it makes up and uh the you know some other interesting species but again it's all that kind of prey that surround their system but if they have good habitat and normal resources like lagomorphs like the uh, rabbits and the snakes and the ground squirrels and stuff like that they generally aren't going to feed upon the the livestock they already you know have evolved for a very very long time to feed on these specific species and yeah they'll scavenge maybe a, a stillborn or a, a dead or dying lamb potentially but the, it's very rare and so if there's any ranchers out there that have livestock and push them through these corridors in the uh, the great basin and these are major major corridors for ranching and lamb uh you know lambing grounds essentially and you can actually look up all the leasing online and see what they put out there and the numbers they potentially put out there and to to know that that many uh you know livestock around the landscape and they're still not feeding on these things i think is a pretty strong statement to say like hey uh you guys don't need to worry about it too much these these birds aren't doing any sort of damage to you guys's livelihood or anything like that and so i think that's one good piece to pull out of this but yeah the, the snakes were kind of an interesting thing as well i wasn't expecting to see that uh, with the gopher snakes and so yeah that's kind of an interesting thing you know uh the the other thing i'm kind of interested in i mentioned a couple times previously is that increase in bird prey all right so between 2020 and 2021 you know it almost doubled essentially um about the, about the amount of birds they were eating and you know initially i hadn't thought too much about that you know there's waterfowl like in that bottom right corner we might worry about those uh those types of birds having, you know, mercury or lead uh, in their system, and then the consumption of them, you know, would basically raise up to the trophic, uh, you know, levels. And these birds, if they ate those waterfowl, would then probably ingest that mercury or that lead, um, just kind of like I talked about early on with that lead paper through ecotoxicology. And we would be concerned about the, the contaminant uh, potentially influencing that developing nestling. Uh, so, you know that's something that I was concerned with in 2021 was that contaminant issue, and now I'm very concerned that uh, the birds that are around open water sources may end up feeding upon waterfowl that have uh, avian influenza, and avian influenza is you know considered to be like a host, or the waterfowl are considered to be hosts or reservoirs for this disease. Um, they may not show signs, they may not get very sick, uh, and when they poop in the water it kind of just distributes the throughout the water you know column in the base and everything and the uh you know it passes through the water and actually the virus can live for even longer in the water than it can in the you know dry air or on some sort of surface that's dry so the virus just stands in the water and the uh other birds pick it up and if these birds are now feeding on waterfowl i'm not worried about mercury so much i'm now worried about the avian influenza because that has a pretty pretty high uh, impact on raptors, especially in nestlings, those developing individuals. So 
that's a, a new concern of mine. And so we're kind of monitoring all of that now. Um, and actually just yesterday, give you guys a, a quick story. I was out at a nest with one of my, uh, my new technician, Kara Beer. She's doing amazing. Uh, that uh, we were going to a nest that had been known to be active previously, uh, had a, a bird incubating at it. We went back, has been checked twice now since then. Uh, and both times, no adult or nestling was seen. So I uh, went back to that nest, we were pulled in, you know, we had monitored it for a quick second, uh, no birds were seen, uh, we pulled down to the nest, uh, no birds around, and saw two eggs sitting in the nest. Uh, we assessed it, we pulled open uh, the camera, uh, this is one of the few cameras I'd left out uh, since uh, early December, I believe. There's a handful of nests that uh, have kind of been okay with cameras for the entire time. And this was one of those nests. And the both eggs were still sitting there. And so we checked the camera data card really quickly to see if they were still around and maybe potentially incubating on these eggs or if they had fully sort of abandoned these uh, this pair of eggs. And yeah, they had actually like fully abandoned these eggs and stopped incubating sometime um, in early April, maybe late March, is from what I can remember. And uh, so we took those eggs with us. They were clearly addled at that point, which basically means they were um, not going to produce young, those eggs. And so uh, communicating with some uh, pathologist colleagues of mine, uh, we're going to actually test some of the amniotic fluid for, you know, uh, maternal antibodies from avian influenza. Well, we'll test it for salmonella, um, a few other different types of uh, bacteria. And then we'll actually do necropsies on these egg uh, embryos to see how they were formed and if they were formed in some sort of uh, maladaptive way or, uh, you know, didn't develop fully and maybe what was the cause of that. And if we find potentially maternal antibodies, avian influenza, that may give us some insight into potentially why uh, we have low rates of nesting this year, or at least um, active nesting, you know, up to this point. So uh, those are just a couple of things that I'm worried about. Also, interestingly, up in the upper right, uh, that's a case of siblicide. So this was in 2021, and the rabbit hemorrhage uh, disease virus had hit. Uh, and I, I honestly, I wasn't worried about this territory and you know they had lots of resources previously and uh birds had fled successfully lived you know are continuing to survive and then in 2021 they had two nestlings that hatched and were doing pretty well up until about the four to five week range and then i was as i was going through the data uh at some point the behavior in the older nestling which probably was like a few days older uh, changed very significantly and became very aggressive, uh, you know, basically food aggressive and kind of mantling over the prey, eating the prey first, um, defending it from the other nestling. And then at one point, it essentially turned on the other nestling and killed and ate a portion of that nestling as well. And this is uh, normal out in the uh, natural world. You know, one of the reasons these birds sometimes will lay two eggs is for this very reason that this second egg may develop into a nestling, uh, the nestling may survive for a while. But it is generally asynchronous, uh, asynchronized hatching, um, which basically just means that one egg may hatch a few days before the other one. The first chick that hatches will obviously get fed first and grow a little bit bigger first, um, and they will be able to outcompete the other nestling. Uh, and if there's not enough prey resources on the landscape to be able to feed both um, to an adequate level, that older, generally more stronger, bigger nestling will then actually usually kill and eat the younger nestling uh, to supplement its resources. Hopefully that it, you know, then will be able to survive to fledging and at least one of the two will um, survive and make it into the population. Um, so it says you know, uh, evolutionary strategy is kind of what it is. Um, and that was not the only case. So in 2020, I had zero cases of siblicide. And in 2021, I had, I think, two or three cases, um, which was very interesting. And then suspecting it's probably because of the RHDT, RHDV2 virus, um, but we'll have to kind of examine that more uh, through statistical analyses as we get through the full data set of photos. And then in the bottom left there, uh, that is the poultry bug. Uh, you might think it looks a lot like a bed bug, uh, and that's because it is in the same family of the simicids. 
So it's essentially a bed bug that is diurnal. It can come out at any time. It's not nocturnal, so it doesn't just come out uh, at night. And if you have to remember too as well, these uh, birds are precocial. So they are stuck in these nests. And if these bugs are in the nest, imagine just being stuck in a bed with bed bugs, you know, 24 seven. It's not a great situation, especially for a developing individual. It's, you know, maximizing all the energy resources it has into uh, physiological development, immune development, you know, cognitive abilities, things like that. And so a uh, very tenuous time for these nestlings and these, uh, you know, essentially blood sucking uh, insects can actually uh, cause them to go anemic and even die. And that's what they've seen up in um, Boise, Idaho. Ben Dudek uh, out of Boise State had done a, a great a research project on these bugs. Um, and they found that they had a pretty significant impact on the survival of nestlings up there. We had never actually had them in Utah, at least from all of our efforts and talking to Kent, he'd actually never encountered them either in all of his 40 year plus years of sampling. And then he alerted me to a nest uh, that was active. And when I went into the nest, uh, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, you know, I was like, oh, these nestlings are, you know, at least one of them is kind of small. Uh, it's kind of weird, but whatever. Put the camera in, left, came back three weeks later, four weeks later for a second sampling, that second sampling round at that seven week age to kind of uh, put a backpack, you know, telemetry backpack on, do an additional bl blood draw to see kind of what they'd been eating and then see if they had any contaminants, parasites, stuff like that. And I'll show you in a minute the outcome of that. And uh, when I followed up with Kent afterwards, he had said that he, when he was in the nest banding, if you saw back to that one of his first photos, he generally just sits inside the nest with the birds when they're really young and bands them that way. And he has said that when he got out of the nest, he had a bunch of kind of uh, welts on his leg. Uh, so they had actually been biting him more than likely. Uh, and another thing about these cameras, and I'll talk about that again in a minute too as well, is this unbiased kind of survival rate. So we have telemetry backpacks on these birds, as well as cameras at the nest. So we can see when the birds fledge and then how long they survive post fledging. Um, and that has provided some very interesting information. So let's get a little bit deeper into these other benefits. Yeah, so yeah, back to that psilocyde. You know, is it food aggression? Is it due to the rabbit hemorrhage disease virus 2 outbreak? You know, I think that's kind of what we can really examine in this, this data set we've collected here at Hawkwash and Collaboration DPG. Uh, and, you know, with the rabbit surveys that us and several, you know, Plenty of other collaborators do. We can maybe get some ideas on the rabbit populations out there, as well as through the the diet analysis I'll be doing, and see if you know the that you know there's a large drop in those those lagomorph prey, and if those lagomorph prey have been the ones that these birds have evolved to eat, maybe they are nutritionally more uh, advantageous for these birds. Maybe they provide more uh, value than the snakes do, um, or the the avian prey these these birds are kind of prey switching to. And that prey switching is normal. I mean, they're apex predators, uh, generalist, you know, feeders. So they'll, you know, pre, you know, prey upon numbers of different species. And I think you looked at that. There was like 35 different species or so in the 2020 sample set, uh, and then in 2021, about 29 species, I believe, in the subsample I've looked at. So you know, could it be that uh, due to the rabbits, these birds became more aggressive for the food and thus created more opportunities for psilocyde. Uh, it could be, we'll have to kind of dig into that more. And I, I think this idea of nutritional value is something that we should look at. A lot of people will look at uh, how much food in a nest based on the biomass. So they'll take, you know, the generalized weight of a jackrabbit. And if they see a jackrabbit brought to the nest, they'll kind of estimate the amount of uh, prey that was brought there of that species and then attribute a value to that. You know, if it's normal jackrabbits, 2.5 kilograms, and only half of it arrives. I'm gonna make myself do math now. Uh, I think it's like 1.75 kilograms of uh, weight that's available or biomass for these birds to eat. Um, but, you know, I, I'm still out uh, on the fence on this one. Uh, and so I have, uh, I've been trying to dig up other ways to kind of assess this stuff. And so that's the simple side question. Uh, food is a vector. Yes. So this is, I really don't look too deeply at this if you don't like bugs or insects. Uh, on the left here is unfortunately a dead nestling. This was at the nest with the culture bug. And the other, so there's two nestlings that were at this nest. The other nestling actually died a few days before this one, maybe one day or two days. Uh, it actually is farther back in this crack system here. 
uh, and this is the older nestling. And you can see from the timestamps, so there's no movement, but it's on this like time lapse system. You can see there's a, a at 12 o'clock. If you zoom in really close and look very closely at the rocks, uh, you don't really see a whole lot of specks. You know, in the background, you can see some specks, but not too much. And then if you look at this other photo, these all these little tiny little red brown dots, those are the poultry bugs. Uh, and this is 30 minutes apart. It's a it's a pretty incredible loading all of a sudden. Like I said, these are diurnal insects, and so you know, with precocial nestlings that are in their nest all day long, these insects can essentially come out and feed at any point in time um, and, you know, withdraw blood from these nestlings. So can we track the, you know, distribution of poultry bugs or the spread of the poultry bug uh, using these cameras? I think that's an interesting thing. Maybe we can find out the vector that's going to be uh, passing these through uh, to other nests uh, if it's through prey. And yeah, I try to figure that out. Maybe some mitigative um, efforts could be found with that as well. Uh, and then kind of finally, uh, we're also seeing a substantial variation in like the feather development of these individuals over time. And then also the fledge age. Um, so both these birds real quick uh, to wrap up, you can see these little antennas in the back. Both of them have those GPS solar Argos uh, transmitter backpacks. Both of these birds, uh, this one's a little bit older. Um, I don't know, probably pretty close to that nine-ish week, 10-ish week range. Uh, the one on the right was right around maybe eight, Ish weeks, you know, a little bit younger. It was uh, not fed quite as well as the one on the left. Both birds fledged, uh, you know, pretty close to the state, and both, I believe, died within about uh, a month of fledging, if not less than that. So, you know, we're finding out that if we were to do sample or, you know, monitoring and uh, surveys based on, you know, say, Fish and Wildlife Service protocol, you know, go there for two hours, watch them go until these birds reach about eight weeks old, that 80% week or their 80% fledge age. Uh, we would watch them, see them like, yep, that bird is good. It's at eight weeks old. Uh, we can probably count that one as in the population or with some sort of kind of uh, statistical method, say this many of those birds went into the population. But we're finding that potentially uh, this may uh, be larger in variation than we thought uh, with this kind of unbiased uh, sampling method of cameras all the way through and then this uh, GPS transmitter data. So uh, if you have any questions about that, please yeah, feel free to reach out for that. So again, you know, we saw, you know, a very interesting distribution of desert nests kind of moving towards the internal corridor, more diverse habitats, more diverse prey systems, uh, definitely a change in uh, prey, definitely birds, uh, you know, a little bit less mammals, but definitely a shift from lagomorphs into other types of prey. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see if we can detect these ecological disturbances in the disease uh, with HPAI and rabbit hemorrhage disease virus too. And yeah, I think that's about it. And with that, I wanna make sure I uh, thank all the supporters and collaborators on this project. Uh, uh, Dr. Steven Slater has been instrumental as well as uh, Dr. Arno Van Vetter, Kezia Menlo, Susanna French and uh, Clark Rushing. My entire uh, PhD committee has been amazing. Uh, uh, formerly of, uh, Doug Way, uh, Proving Ground, Natural Resources Office, uh, Robert, Robert Knight has been also instrumental in providing funding for this project, uh, as well as, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service provided us a number of transmitters to put out on this uh, on these birds to kind of track their survival. Uh, Utah State University uh, Ecology Center has done a great job and actually provided me with some additional funding to look more into this kind of eDNA uh, diet analysis stuff that I've been kind of thinking about. NIFWIF has also provided us funding for this last year, this third year of sampling and testing, which has been amazing. Really, it's going to help us kind of push through and finish off the study. And then again, uh, just the UVDL, uh, Utah Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and the two uh, academic labs I'm in, and being advised by the, all those folks have been incredibly um, helpful in my development as a graduate student, as an academic, and uh, just as a scientist overall. So I want to thank all those folks for all of their uh, support. Uh, and with that, I think I'm all done. So, Sammy, um, I will you like? So, if anybody has questions, now is the time to put it in the chat. I know we're running a little over, but if you have any questions, I would love to pose them to Dustin. Um, just for myself, Dustin, I was wondering, are the poultry bugs native or are those invasive? It's a great question. Um, so, the poultry bugs have been found in the U.S. for quite some time. Uh, People think they may be actually expanding their range, though, due to climate change. So 
uh, I think the farthest north I've heard is, yeah, kind of like in the southern Idaho area. And I think maybe some up along the west coast, uh, maybe where it's a little bit wetter of a system. And the nest actually we found it on was actually very close to the Great Salt Lake. And I had a data logger in there. So we'll see if that may have had an impact on those uh, poultry bugs. But yeah, um, I think they are considered native uh, to at least the southern part of the US. Okay. Um, so at the moment, I don't have any questions, just some thank yous. So I think we'll wrap this up. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you again, Dustin. Um, so with that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.